So the Sea in the Hills is a good little nature poem and uh, Kipling is a really good writer so I recommend reading his other poems and also his short stories if you're interested in him. He wrote The Jungle Book along with other things so he's quite versatile, kind of interesting different topics that he writes on. So yeah, you can maybe sort of start this lesson by thinking about the sea and the different characteristics of the sea, the different qualities of a sea, what the sea means to you, uh, different moods that you've experienced the sea being in. And then we'll jump into the poem. So I recommend to pause me for a minute and just read the poem aloud to yourself. It's very sound based, this poem, so Try and notice the sounds as you go through. They're kind of hard to miss in a way. So yeah, pause me now and read through the poem. So yeah, we have a lot of S sounds recurring. We call that sibilance, you might have noticed it. Um, swell, stark, showing, slackens. Sight of salt water, crash. Foamless, enormous, lots of S sounds. It's got a lot of power and kind of dynamism to this poem so you might notice the energy of the poem as it goes through you might notice also the punctuation is really significant here so we'll look at that a little bit later so there's a little bit of vocab if you're not sure about some of the words in the poem you can just have a look at the vocab now and then we're going to jump into the summary so the sea is a boundless entity with no limits and it can be very changing in its personality can be sweet and smooth beautiful but also frightening brutal violent and you can notice that a boat at sea thrashed around by the storm is really under threat so there's a lot of violent potential in the energy of the sea and there's this interesting kind of latent energy, even when the sea is calm, we can kind of notice that the stillness can turn to anger. There's also a sense of the sea being governed by the moon, which is true. So the moon actually controls the tides of the sea. And also things like wind, breezes, they'll change the nature of the sea as well. So you might notice the interaction in this poem of humans with the sea and think about how how they do that, how they interact with and use the sea, but also how the sea can be antagonistic or threatening to them as well. We can also think about the difference between the stability of land and the mutability or changeability of the sea and the different ways that humans use the sea as well. So things like trade, um, you know, adventure, the way that um, you know we would, especially in olden times, use the sea for travel or exploration. Finally, at the end, you might notice that there's this. Oh, where's it gone? <laughs> I'll try and show you a little bit more. The final stanza. We've got this idea of the difference between sea men and hill men. So, men that live on land and men that are desirous of the sea. This reminds me of um, the opening to a book called Moby Dick, so if you're interested in this theme, you can have a read of the opening chapter of Moby Dick, which is a really epic story about a guy who goes whale hunting. And he works and lives on land at the beginning, but he has this urge to go to sea. He's really sick of the land, and he kind of goes uh, through all the different advantages of the sea and the kind of um, difference between sea people and land people, people who are kind of drawn to the sea, people who are drawn to the land. You can also pause here and think about your own relationship with water. Do you like the sea or do you find it frightening? Do you enjoy boats or swimming in the sea? You might think back to holidays or experiences at the beach. Your own relationship with water. So personally, I absolutely love water and I really like being in even difficult or choppy water I enjoy. I don't really like being on choppy boats because I get a little bit seasick, but yeah, I, I quite appreciate the sea in all its forms, including the more rough or violent ones. 
most of my friends though were really terrified of it when it's like that there was one time when i was in italy and uh, i tried to convince my friend to go swimming from one beach to another beach that was about an hour's swim away and i thought it would be fine and she just panicked because it was way too deep the water and it was too choppy and so we had to turn back so yeah if you've ever had any experiences like that with sea you might kind of jot down a few notes on them and your recollections of being in the sea when it's calm versus when it's choppy and difficult. So the speaker is definitely a man who is attracted to and drawn to the idea of the sea and the kind of um, danger or sort of choppiness of the sea. There's a lot of imagery in this poem, so you might want to have a look a little bit more at the auditory and visual imagery that's described here. There's also a lot of repetition and you might want to think about how does that reflect the character of the sea? Why would you use uh, recursive lines or recursive imagery? There's also a lot of personification. So the sea is kind of like characterized as a human or kind of spiritual entity. Like it has its own character, its own personality, its own will that it enacts upon humans. You might notice the pronouns she and her, they're really significant. So the sea is quite violent and sort of masculine in its characteristics, but also characterized as, um, yeah, female used, you know, they use uh, female pronouns to describe the sea there. There's also a sense of symbolism present in the poem. So the little descriptions of the different types of men or the different types of sea, they're all symbolic of, of wider mechanisms of the world and how the universe works. So you might want to go back through the poem and, and try and think about the, the sort of specific symbolism that Kipling's using. Yeah, so structurally, um, I said we'd have a look at punctuation, so we'll maybe go back to the poem for that now. Notice how many questions there are, rhetorical questions, repetition of questions, but also variations in those questions. And think about why is that? Why has he used similar questions, but also changes and variations? Also notice the dashes and think about what do they do to the line? They create pauses in the flow of the poem. Maybe like the point where a wave sort of rises up and pauses before it breaks on itself. You might notice as well the, the just the line length, it looks like a wave so it's kind of swelling towards the center of the stanza and then pulling back and then swelling again. So it's quite interesting, especially this part of each stanza. There's a sense of regularity and irregularity inherent in this poem at the same time, which is quite clever I think as a way to depict the ebbs and flows of the sea the repetition of the sea, but also the unpredictability. So the tension between order and chaos very much within the, the behavior of the sea that's reflected in the structure of the poem. They're quite strange stanzas, they're septets, seven line stanzas. So they're quite long and it feels a little bit like a monologue, like a speech from a character for that reason. There's also a really strict regularity to the rhyme scheme. So you might think about why has he done that? There's um, a couplet, a triplet, and then a couplet. Instead of three couplets, it's a little bit more kind of big, the rhyme sound in the center of the, of the stanza. Yeah, so one thing that's interesting about Kipling, I was saying he's a writer of stories as well as poetry, um, also a journalist. I've actually not read any of his journalism, but I imagine it's very good. He's quite colonial, so he was um, born in India and, uh, you know, things like the Jungle Book reflect that really strongly. He's a very famous writer in his time. There's an analysis I did that um, you can see it on YouTube, actually. It's one of my most famous, not necessarily famous, but like well-watched videos. And it's about If, another poem called If. It's really interesting, very different to this one. Um, so yeah, he writes quite interesting poetry that sometimes is natural sometimes philosophical. So you might want to think about, you know, the philosophy of this poem, what kinds of ideas is it presenting there? And he's used to travel and he's interested in exploration 
and his writings influenced by that. So the sea is kind of like an entity that connects different places together. It gives you the capacity to travel and explore, especially in this time, there's no airplanes. So when he's talking about the sea, despite its danger, that is also a representation of freedom there. And you can think about the tension between those two things. And there's a quite famous novel that he wrote called Kim. And two of the stanzas in this poem actually already turn up in that novel. So if you're interested in delving a little bit more deeply into Kipling, you might read Kim or bits of Kim and think about the connection between his novel Kim and then this poem as well. So in terms of attitudes or sort of beliefs here, we definitely have the idea that C is an adventurous, free entity. It represents action, adventure, freedom, journeys, but also danger and this, this sort of potential for violence and disruption and chaos. At this time, especially, it was, it was quite, you know, a real threat that you could get very much destroyed by a storm if you traveled on the sea. There's something alluring and um, kind of attractive about the sea, despite its danger, or maybe perhaps because of it. And there's different personalities. So hillmen in the poem, who are people who live on land, they tend to just stick to the stable structure of land. They stay with what they know. And seamen go far, like sailors and people who like traveling on the sea. They want adventure, they want newness, they want um, variety and kind of to experience more of life, even though that's more dangerous. So there's a lot of tension between safety and danger in the personality of the characters in this poem. There's also a sense of um, the natural element of water, sort of the spiritual aspects of water, we could perhaps say in a more pagan sense. So you might want to look into the sea god Poseidon, for example, and how he represents the sea and how he was viewed or worshipped in ancient Greek culture. Um, because the sea is described as she, we can imagine that the sea in this poem is not exactly Poseidon, it's more of a kind of female um, natural entity, but it does still have that kind of like almost godlike quality to it, or goddess-like quality in this case. So you might see that as reflecting the maternal essence in nature, like the idea of mother nature, um, or the kind of feminine power of nature. There is also this sense of um, the womb and the tides. Apparently there's tides in the womb as well. Yes, there's a sense of like, you know, birth, womanhood, femininity inherent in the element of water. And, um, you know, there's that kind of aspect being drawn out in the poem as well, which is kind of contrary to the sort of masculine sense of adventure that the men who like to sail embody. So it's almost like a relationship between the sailor and the sea. So if you want a few little exercises to do on this poem, you should be able to have a look, have a look at these revision questions and try this essay question as well. You might also want to make some mind maps on um, the themes of the poem. Uh, so yeah, sorry, <laughs> my cat's just decided she's going to meow constantly at me. But um, so yeah, try this essay question if you feel ready. So there's a sense of, you know, the tension between longing for wildness and a desire for home. And like I say, you should uh, look at the, the difference between hill and sea people uh, in order to explore that essay question. Think about yourself as well. Are you an adventurer or a home bird? Do you like safety and security and uh, familiarity and regularity? Or do you like for variation uh, novelty, um, exploration, expansion of your uh, worldly experience, because I don't think there's a right and wrong answer to that one. It's just your personal taste, your own personality. I'm definitely an adventure person. I get really trapped if I do the same thing too often. So I'm with Kipling on this one. Um, but yeah, I do see the appeal of safety and security that hillmen prefer as well. So yeah, thank you very much for listening and hopefully you enjoyed this poem and I'll see you guys soon in a future lesson. 
if you want any more resources or you want full courses, downloadable documents, video lessons, you can go to scribbly.com as well there.